to some extent, uh, most of things, of course, that what we do um, in innovation um, relates to many biomedical developments. Of course, uh, you, you're very familiar with uh, um, what you've created with uh, ICON. And uh, we're making enormous maps of the brain now, which, uh, as I tell uh, students and residents, when they say, you know, now we can see in living color the uh, connection of the motor cortex down to the brain. And I said, did you not know this existed before you saw a color picture of it? So it's very, uh, very worrisome uh, to me. And uh, on the right side, probably something that's being worked on here in Stockholm, but this is a, a quadriplegic uh, patient um, who uh, um, is now directing movement of a robotic arm uh, with uh, um, an implanted uh, electrode in the, uh, in the brain. So uh, in the light of today's compliance rules, and I know ELECT is very focused at these days on compliance issues. So uh, under compliance, I have to tell you that I am a stockholder um, and that I serve on the uh, Data Safety Monitoring Board of Focus Ultrasound with NSITIC and uh, have uh, started and uh, have been past chair of a uh, research foundation looking at outcomes for gamma knife. So when I entered the field of neurosurgery, uh, comes the first day comes a CT scanner. We arrived on the same day. Uh, this was a late period of the end of Vietnam War. Uh, it was a very hairy uh, sort of uh, time. Um, and uh, you can see that uh, over the course of uh, time, um, uh, how things have uh, changed. Uh, um, at, at least I still have some hair, so that's, uh, that, that's been good. And uh, I think I'm indebted for Danny for this picture. Uh, you can obviously tell who the chairman was, um, the professor. He was the only one allowed to wear the hat, and probably the only one who could smoke a cigar uh, while they uh, took the uh, picture of his, uh, of his uh, um, group. Yeah, so um, a number of, uh, f I'm sure, famous trainees uh, after that, uh, but looking a little bit different than what my own uh, um, career uh, looked like. Actually, when I was at training in Pittsburgh, I became very interested in combination of guiding devices and technology. And so we first built a uh, guiding device at that time. This was now um, the first time an open CT scanner was available. So this is the dark ages for many of you uh, to believe that this actually occurred. So we built this device, and as a resident, this was again a different time. There was no attending physician, no, nobody in the department who knew how to do stereotactic surgery or how to use a guiding device. So we built our own, and then we began to do cases, even as uh, when I was in training, and this, this would be totally illegal nowadays, uh, I'm uh, completely sure. Uh, but uh, then I came to Sweden in 1979 for the first time um, for six weeks, and I thought this is a remarkable place um, of what's being uh, created here. So I developed this opportunity, meeting first with Eric Backlund, uh, who you see up in the upper right. And uh, um, it struck me uh, that uh, uh, training, as Mark Twain, one of my favorite uh, quotes, um, is extremely important uh, to, uh, to what we do. And the reason I bring that up, that when I came to Sweden in 1980, uh, this was the stipend that I had uh, for a year in Sweden. Now, um, I'm sure it's much better uh, nowadays. If you actually uh, um, now look at what that was worth uh, in 2017 dollars, it's only worth $29,000. I'm sure that's like a weekly wage for most of you uh, uh, here in, uh, at, 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 at Electa. But... Uh, Finally, at, uh, at Christmas, uh, we, it was very hard. To, we went down to the market, and we were so starved for a fresh vegetable that we actually paid $4 um, at that time uh, in 1980 to get a head of cauliflower, uh, which always put me in uh, a reminding of this Mark Twain qu quote. So I came under the influence of Eric Backlund, who was uh, over liquor uh, in Stockholm, and uh, he had this concept, as I did, and of this combination of medical imaging, and these are actually diagrams that I made from his drawings. And together then uh, came a family of uh, people, um, first uh, endovascular types of surgery, uh, radiosurgery, and uh, marriage of imaging uh, with uh, surgical technologies, then called therapeutic scanning, but now, of course, another arm uh, with the invention of uh, and use of endoscopic uh, surgery. So I learned a variety of things when I was here, which I took back uh, to Pittsburgh uh, with me. One was uh, guided uh, surgery. Uh, this is the Lexell frame of that time. Here's George Nerea and then Professor Lexell in the background. Again, probably be totally illegal now because I was, uh, you know, I was a non-physician uh, in the eyes of the Swedish government, I think. 
uh, uh, Bjorn Meersen uh, doing a uh, uh, thalamotomy uh, uh, procedure, and a variety of things, uh, including uh, management of trigeminal neuralgia and uh, radiosurgery. <coughs> so when I came back, we had this concept of developing a more civilized form of brain surgery uh, using uh, <coughs> this uh, first uh, a 201 source uh, gamma knife or the, uh, or the uh, U knife. But before we could get that going, as uh, uh, Danny said, it was a little bit of a challenge uh, to get this through the regulatory authorities because nobody knew what a gamma knife was. And frankly, there really wasn't a lot published at that particular time over its potential value. And that's something we'll get back to towards the end. We decided instead to concentrate on building a stereotactic operating room. So we uh, put a CT scanner in an operating room at that time in the city of Pittsburgh, about the size of Stockholm. There were only two CT scanners in the whole city. Um, and we had to sell this to the government based on the fact that, in fact, it was a therapeutic device. It was not used for diagnosis. Now, you're aware of many other pioneers in the field of neurosurgery, of which I am not. I would say that I've concentrated, as we'll see more, on the aspects of the subsequent innovation. But there are many people who were involved in critical uh, junction points. This is my view of only some of the more important ones. Uh, obviously, Oliva Krona here. Peter Ginetta was my mentor for many years in uh, uh, Pittsburgh, who was uh, chairman before I was. And of course, uh, the father of uh, uh, this company and many other things. Uh, Lars Luxell. So it began to make me think a little bit about this process of uh, uh, innovation and this cycle that happens um, that when something new is brought out, the first reaction, especially in the medical community, but I would say even highest among neurosurgeons, is to say, no, it can't be true. Um, and so skepticism uh, uh, it comes. And then eventually evidence builds. There comes acceptance more and more of this, and it becomes even standard practice, which is where radiosurgery has become. But the cycle keeps going because even standard practice, we can realize, can be improved, and therefore there needs to be the need for, for new innovation. So as a company, I'm sure you think about all of these particular things. Uh, is what we're developing serious? Um, is it going to make things better? Is it reasonably safe? Uh, uh, how bad is the competition that we're going to uh, fight against? Uh, is it important uh, over the world as a priority? Um, and is there any evidence to actually support the, its outcomes? In neurosurgery and probably many medical fields, there's a 25-year lapse of which nobody reads anything, um, so that uh, often things are reinvented uh, that were actually uh, fixed 20 years ago. So uh, then you have to look back and make sure it's truly innovative. And then are you willing uh, to help build evidence of value and, and may it, will it have some chance of less? And, and as a company, you're aware of all of these uh, kinds of things, the difference between a disruptive innovation, which is what Gamma Knife was, and uh, over the course of time, the evolution of the Gamma Knife, which then became a sustaining innovation. But when we got started on this, and I, this was not, I was not the pioneer, uh, Lars Lexell and the Swedish uh, group at Karolinska were. But it was very clear that the problems and its uh, value was not very well uh, understood and I didn't know that it was going to be potentially dramatic or game-changing. And basically, we didn't know what we were getting into at the time, whereas today's customers will certainly, uh, certainly understand that. So we began on some innovative concepts of guided brain surgery. What I learned in Stockholm, we could, uh, for example, in an awake patient, we could uh, take out a, a cyst in the middle of the brain. We had to have a device, the, uh, so we put together this uh, device to allow us to do imaging without the arc on the frame. And uh, I still get millions of dollars of royalties on this uh, um, now from the uh, Electa every, uh, every year. I'm sure it's one of the made products that uh, is, uh, is, is out there. But it turns out, of course, that while certain uh, cases like that might be suitable, the reality was is that some were really not. And so we began to develop this uh, guided port technique uh, coupled with stereotactic technologies and a guiding probe holder uh, for this that allows us to be able to go through the brain to actually remove a uh, uh, lesion deep within the, uh, with, within the brain. So this represents this sort of parallel development that we were interested in, as has this company been in uh, um, imaging, I arrived uh, with a CT scanner in 1975. This took uh, some 12 years later. And of course, there have been dramatic changes, both in imaging as well as in radiosurgery techniques. 
So the wheel uh, band back here with the old uh, U unit and uh, over the uh, three decades, it's now been 30 years, we were able to expand uh, this. So radius surgery started out as a very limited role for which Lars Lexel related to functional neurosurgery. This had to do with certain patients with uh, untreatable behavioral disorders, certain patients with severe movement disorders, but as data emerged, then more and more of this began to be uh, used. And so as a result, the value and role of radiosurgery uh, began to greatly uh, increase. So the concept of one of the first persons that I trained uh, in Pittsburgh uh, applied for a job saying he was in 1987 that he was trained in radiosurgery. And the person who uh, was looking at him wrote him back and said, if I need my radio fixed, I will call you. And so that was the sort of concept of uh, the knowledge of what radiosurgery was compared to what it is uh, now. So we're going to take a few minutes uh, to talk about four specific areas and where this has uh, advanced, both in skull base, uh, vascular neurosurgery, functional neurosurgery, and some more malignant tumors. So we know that um, this uh, is what we traditionally did, but surgery through the nose to remove tumor here. But what the, uh, the sustaining innovation was is by coupling this with endoscopic techniques, we could reach many more areas of the brain by still going through the nose uh, rather than um, by traditional ways. So a child such as this with this pituitary tumor who comes in with a poor vision has a tumor removed almost completely, but there's a small remnant uh, here that we can see and is perfect uh, now for gamma knife as a part two. We can get beautiful plans and beautiful imaging of this. We can relate it to critical structures within the uh, brain. And then now we can follow it over the course of many years where we see that the tumor not only is uh, controlled, that is, doesn't grow, but it's actually shrinking over the course of time and in fact is sustained. So the benefit uh, is sustained. And eventually, we, uh, to be able to look more at this, we uh, formed a consortium uh, um, headquartered in Pittsburgh um, where now I think there are 30 international centers uh, who are involved in outcomes research related to the uh, usage uh, of Gamma Knife and have published uh, many uh, things over the uh, course of the years uh, showing the sustaining uh, innovation of this uh, approach. And while at the same time we try to not forget some of the things, uh, of some of which I learned in, uh, in uh, Stockholm when I was here as a uh, fellow, uh, intracavitary radiation allows us to place radiation isotopes uh, um, into uh, uh, a tumor. I see it uh, gradually shrink over the course of time, such as this child, most of whom would need more invasive surgery in today's world because 25 is, years have passed. We already are forgetting some of the things that we learned, but this is a great technique which saves actually pituitary function and leads to complete collapse of the uh, tumor over time. So the growth of radiosurgery was against is the general concept of what surgical microscopic surgery could be done. And it started out as a relatively small impact on this, um, and looking basically at residual or leftover tumors that uh, could not be surgically cured. Um, and then it began to grow, and as it grow, it ends up with a huge impact on the, uh, what we now know, one of its major worldwide roles, which is in cancer management. Um, and still having an impact on a variety of things such as vestibular schwannomas or acoustic neuromas for which there are still big arguments as to what's the best way to do this. But for an acoustic neuroma, we can do these very elegant plans that are 3D conformal. This is a 90-year-old uh, patient uh, that has this growing tumor. Um, and we know that after these many years of 30 you know, so of uh, looking at this, uh, the risk now of facial nerve problems, 1% feeling nerve, 3%. And then patients who have useful hearing, uh, saving hearing in up to 75% of patients. And we can see over the course of time that the tumors, uh, even larger tumors such as this starting out at the time of gamma knife, gradually shrinking uh, with sustained growth, but a different outcome. Not now you see it as most surgeons think. I want to see it, take it out, and now I don't see it on the skin. The goal of this change, the goal is now you see the tumor, now you still see the patient, but the tumor um, is going to be controlled or shrink over the course of time. And then we began to look at certain subfields of this. So cystic tumors, which is one of the things that all my colleagues say, well, these won't respond. These are tumors with small bubbles within them. And in fact, by looking at this over the course of many years, we can see that the tumors that picked up the dye 
actually shrank, but not nearly as much or as fast as the tumors that had small cysts or even larger cysts associated with them. And what about hearing? Could we do better in the course of hearing? And one of the things we found is uh, uh, that if we did this sooner in patients with these tumor, uh, which now there's a big push, at least uh, in the US and perhaps some centers, just to watch and don't do anything right now. But we found as the, in fact, the hearing preservations were much better over patients if they were treated within three years of diagnosis rather than continuing uh, to wait. For patients who have leftover or recurrent tumors after prior surgery, with the, uh, we have a 93% chance of he uh, he uh, hearing of some type, but we have tumor control rates in the patients with residual or recurrent tumors of 94%. So how does this change uh, what we do as teachers in the, the field? And that is we have to begin to adjust because uh, in our case experience over the course of time as the gamma knife uh, roll began to grow and mature, then what happens is more and more of these patients uh, have uh, that approach rather than going through open uh, surgery. Now, skull-based tumors such as this meningioma, often considered a big uh, testament of skill for uh, neurosurgeons, Instead, the uh, goal being uh, to get the tumor to stop growing over the course of uh, time. We could look at those patients trying to say, well, do you really need to do surgery on these patients? And it turns out if they had not had the prior surgery, there's a chance that their function could improve com by doing gamma knife only than the actual preservation of existing function and the opportunity to see improvement of function uh, was uh, very important and obvious as well. We could treat uh, deep-seated tumors deep within the brain. This is sort of the edge of uh, what the bottom uh, of the brain in terms of what the gamma knife uh, can uh, treat, and uh, often in very difficult locations for surgical removal, and the, here at seven years, a tumor that is significantly smaller. Another indication was vascular malformations. This was one of the prime uh, indications that emerged after many years uh, of work in Stockholm and then went uh, um, to other countries uh, as well. With this concept of uh, AVMs or blood vessel malformations located in critical areas of the brain, this one would be in the motor area of the brain. We can treat this type of uh, problem with radiosurgery very effectively uh, to get it to close. And even ones where nobody in their right mind would consider doing surgery for, uh, one located within the brain stem itself, we can treat uh, with uh, gamma knife alone, uh, not by trying to embolize it, for example, and three years later see complete obliteration of this uh, AVM. <clears throat> and then in a multicenter group that we looked at, a large group of patients over the course of time, we could actually detect now what was the risk while we're waiting for the uh, AVM to close, uh, less than 2%. And the risks of a side effect are usually temporary uh, and relatively low uh, in group of patients that eventually would have a high risk of bleeding and death if nothing is uh, done. We then began to, based on volume of cases, began to increase in difficult locations. We could develop guidelines for what was needed uh, to get rid of this AVM and what was safe. So that was largely unknown when the first patient was treated here in Stockholm with an AVM. Nobody knew what the dose was. Nobody knew what the effect was going to be. But over the course of time, uh, we could look at uh, um, this uh, case experience and begin to predict what was the risk of a side effect by doing gamma knife uh, versus the location of, of the AVM. We began to look at what other vascular problems that these patients had. Some had bubbles on the proximal on blood vessels near it, an aneurysm. If that was uh, uh, not treated, then these patients had a relatively high risk of having a stroke or a hemorrhage from this. So we began to learn that we need to do something for those patients who either uh, have no aneurysm or have their aneurysm clipped or coiled if they also have an AVM. We also learned that uh, in certain group of patients for having gamma knife, that if they had prior embolization, that is a shrinkage effect by trying to put glue into this uh, to shrink it, those patients actually did worse. The outcomes or the chances of closure of the AVM were much worse, and actually the uh, risks uh, of both were uh, simply uh, higher than they, they should be. Um, and again, we've looked at this in um, multi-series cohort groups. Uh, the advantage of having a large database, which we began to create uh, in 1987 when we treated the first patient, uh, is that we could then begin to look over many years, and by combining that data with other centers, uh, um, we could uh, look at the overall uh, benefit. 
We also looked at larger volume ones, uh, the ones that nobody wanted to do anything with, and we looked at it from the standpoint, well, we could do this in two or more stages using uh, a treatment of one volume and then a second stage treating another volume with the goal of eventually getting rid of the, uh, of the AVM. We even looked at uh, ones which became somewhat controversial over time. These are vascular malformations often located in critical areas of the brain. And uh, if we treated them, uh, we could stop the bleed rate of bleeding or strokes from these uh, dramatically within about two years and then down to a very low risk uh, after that uh, with treatment uh, um, of this using uh, gamma knife. And when we published the article on this, it's one of the things that we'll talk again a little bit at the end, um, the, when you look at skepticism or, or rebuttal, this article came out, and then from my friends at the Karolinska Institute at that time came a rebuttal article, which was three pages longer than my article, um, saying about how you shouldn't do this kind of thing. But uh, we, uh, we, uh, we kept uh, going. Um, so we talk uh, now switch gears a little bit about some functional indications. Uh, uh, one of the things I learned in Stockholm was how to reach the Gasserian ganglion through a needle. This is actually, again, a very old technique using a guiding device from 1933 uh, 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 here in uh, Europe. And I learned about treating trigeminal neuralgia by uh, placing uh, um, glycerol into the uh, nerve uh, through, a, uh, through a needle. But uh, then I also learned that actually gamma knife would be a very effective uh, technique technique with less likelihood of causing uh, much feeling loss or sensation loss. So we could make these beautiful maps using MRI scan of the uh, target. We could look at outcomes saying that the patients uh, had a good chance of pain relief, up to 80% of patients are either pain-free, 65% uh, pain-free off medication, others uh, improved and reduced medication. We could do it again if we needed to. If there's a relapse over the course of time, a second procedure uh, could be uh, done, a little bit different target, maybe overlapping a little bit. And we could look at, again, the timing of when to do it. And as we might expect, a person who has had a problem for fewer years is more likely to do better than a patient who's had a problem for many years that's been ignored. So in looking at this particular game, we could say that uh, patients with a short duration of pain uh, had the best chance of a long-term pain relief, but after many years of pain, then the pain relief permanency uh, really went, went down. And we could see the number of patients with permanent complete pain relief began to com fade compared to the ones who were treated earlier in their diagnosis. Over the years, we also did a variety of animal types of uh, work. Uh, the baboon uh, work, uh, of course, can't hardly be done anymore. Uh, um, uh, but one of the things that needed to be found out was what actually happens to this nerve when you uh, do gamma knife. Uh, baboon has a very robust uh, nerve. Uh, here's the normal lining uh, of the nerve cells, the myelin sheaths. Um, and six months after doing gamma knife for this nerve, we could see that we were, in fact, obliterating and causing demyelination of this nerve, which is one of the means that, by which it, it actually works. More recent work done with a, a colleague uh, um, uh, in our group, uh, uh, Dr. Musavi, began to look at outcomes based on something that nobody ever talked about, and that is we give everybody the same dose based on that's what everybody did. The reality is that we actually need to adjust the dose based on the volume of the nerve because the nerve is, can be small or big or long or short, depending on the patient. And it turns out when we look at the actual dose delivered, uh, if we can keep the dose uh, in this 1.4 to 2.7 millijoules of energy to the nerve, that these patients are the patients who have the best pain relief and the least sensory loss, which is in fact the goal of the uh, procedure, at least the best, uh, the best outcome. With new imaging techniques, we maybe actually see the nerve and detect the myelin sheath of the nerve and actually quantify the amount of myelin in there. We can then do targeting that based on that. We can add uh, um, special imaging suit, uh, thanks to this uh, uh, high density uh, fiber tractography looking at the trigeminal nerve. Um, we can then put a shot uh, here, and we can actually count the myelin fibers in the uh, nerve using this type of uh, technology. So one of the things that was brought to my attention, uh, Doug Kanzioko, of course, worked with me for many years. He had a medical student uh, who's interested in neurosurgery, is this concept of how does something happen eventually to get accepted 
in the field as a viable or useful alternative. And this concept of progressive scholarly acceptance, I think, is quite true. And that is when you first start out with this uh, new technique, as in the case of trigeminal neuralgia, we see a variety of publications sort of saying, well, uh, yes, uh, yeah, it was probably, uh, we did it, it, you know, okay. But eventually what happens is that long-term outcome data begins to happen. Then this now is not the usual sort of, well, I treated five patients or eight patients. It's this is what the long-term benefit it was. And at this point when these lines cross, that this now becomes a, something that's been shown to be of value in the, uh, um, in the medical literature. Now, what about uh, um, thalamotomy? Uh, we do this, uh, one of the original indications for which uh, Lexel uh, uh, wanted to use the agama knife, and one of the earliest indications in pain, treating uh, movement disorders for patients with a, either a central tremor or Parkinson's disease. We can do staged procedures uh, in patients who, who have a good response to the first stage. A year later, we will uh, end up doing it for the other stage. We don't have to uh, worry about patients who are on blood thinners or other reasons that make surgery of traditional type or even deep brain st uh, stimulation to be uh, um, not f feasible. And again, going back to the concept of combination of imaging with uh, technology, the uh, plans for imaging have become fantastic in terms of what we move. This is a standard MRI scan to look at the VIM nucleus of the uh, thalamus. Uh, we can give uh, the dose which we think is appropriate uh, to be able to control tremor. But this is a patient's own brain map. We don't have to use atlases anymore. This is a 7T preoperative imaging which we can, can't do with our guiding devices on. We can do this without that and then we can co-register them uh, to the images. We can put in the maps to be able to identify the appropriate uh, target uh, of this. And more importantly, the complication which is if you miss target here, then you cause a con arm or leg weakness on the, on the other side of the, of the uh, body. We can actually segment the thalamus into specific uh, nuclei. We can use uh, diffusion traction, uh, diffusion uh, uh, imaging to be able to uh, uh, perform this high definition mapping of uh, the target uh, to interrupt, which is the one that's associated uh, with the tremor development uh, in uh, patients. Now for cancer or malignant uh, tumors, of course, the greatest growth or the reason that the gamma knife, I think, is sustained was the finding that it could be used in uh, um, metastatic cancer when it's uh, spread to the brain. And the reason was that when we surgically remove these types of tumors, we can take this lump out, but we don't solve the problem that there are all these uh, cells that are on the periphery of this, uh, of this target. So in the old days, this was what we would do. Uh, we see this and take it out. Now you have the nice uh, thing, but that's not what this patient had. This patient had gamma knife uh, for this, even for this larger tumor, no craniotomy, uh, no, uh, no surgery. And over the long run, we could determine that uh, we could control tumor growth um, and uh, the cause of death could be moved from cancer in the brain to cancer somewhere spreading in the body. And so the push could go back to our communities uh, to, um, of neuro-oncologists, uh, concentrate on how you're going to save the patient from systemic disease rather than from the, uh, from the brain. And then it became uh, very visible in multiple uh, uh, publications over the course of time that the most important thing we had to do with cancer was to kill the tumor but not the patient or their brain at the, uh, at the same time. When we looked at patients who had traditional treatment with radiation therapy, uh, what we could see is that over the course of one to two years, basically their brains began to no longer work very well. Um, and that's related to the white matter injury that occurs from traditional wide field radiation uh, therapy. And this has led to a significant change in the uh, management across the world of this. This is my uh, partner in radiosurgery, uh, Dr. Flickinger who of course spent uh, many uh, years uh, doing whole brain radiation uh, therapy before uh, the development of, uh, of uh, radiosurgery. Now there's certainly challenges that emerge. How big, uh, when do you actually need uh, the whole brain and only in the context of uh, widespread disease and when it uh, spreads uh, through the spinal fluid pathway. We know what the doses are. We uh, know that the, the uh, number of patients, is, uh, or rather tumors, is not important. It's the total volume of all the tumors added together that is more predictive of, of response and, uh, and when uh, to use it. 
We also learned that uh, we could replace radiation therapy with radiosurgery after removal of tumors and do radiosurgery to uh, very focused of this. Uh, we wish that there were more effort that had gone or could go into cost-effective analysis, but it's extremely difficult to do in the United States because of the accounting methodologies uh, for this. But uh, it's still work that has been done. Um, in malignant tumors of the brain, uh, primary tumors, glioblastomas, we've uh, b begun a trial um, which we started uh, in part with uh, funding from uh, Electa through the foundation. Um, and that is uh, to add uh, um, radiosurgery and uh, um, a vascular drug, uh, um, bevacizumab or Vestin, to this, uh, thinking that this was how we could do radiosurgery for bigger tumors. But if we included a volume, so we included a border zone where the tumor is going to grow back, that we could greatly improve the outcomes in these particular patients. And in fact, when we uh, looked at the Kaplan-Meier survival rates of these patients, when they got gamma knife plus a Vastin, then really we could significantly improve uh, the survival time of these patients who are, again, uh, recurrent tumors after a significant... Uh, um, I got, well, this is about the weight problem that uh, Danny was reminding me about. Um, and uh, some of the things that when you're do doing uh, a technology or a development to some degree, uh, you get great ideas. Um, the, one of the ideas was uh, in the U.S., uh, you know, there's, there are no U.S. bodies in this room um, because, uh, fortunately, your genetic makeup has, uh, um, or your diet or both has uh, allowed you to uh, have nice Swedish bodies. Um, but uh, the uh, reality is there are many uh, of us who uh, um, look like this sumo wrestler uh, here and who may not be eligible for bypass surgery. So we said, well, maybe we could use Gamma Knife to be able to uh, do this. We started out by making fat monkeys. Uh, fat monkeys uh, are made by uh, a diet of heavy potato chips, uh, which they are, uh, will do anything uh, to. Um, and uh, make a, a lesion in the hypothalamus uh, here uh, uh, to suppress uh, diet. We could create lesions in these particular animals uh, using a, a sub-therapeutic dose of radiation. We could see imaging changes in the region of the hypothalamus, and we could detect uh, weight loss uh, in these animals because they uh, stopped uh, eating uh, or being fond of potato chips, among other things. In fact, they disliked any high-fat uh, diet. They would continue to eat what Swedes eat, fruits and nuts and special treats, maybe sometime, maybe some chocolate. Um, but uh, what would happen was the uh, weight would, in fact, go down on, uh, on, on these animals. So we thought, this is a fantastic idea. We went to the bariatric surgeons. They said, yes, we agree with you. This is a fantastic idea because to be a bariatric surgery center to lose weight, you have to have very good outcomes, and that means you can't, nobody can die when you do the surgery. So there are a lot of patients who get rejected for surgery because of high uh, risks for this. And the hospital actually agreed to support five patients for this, and we went to the IRB, um, and the IRB say, no way. You're, there's no way you're going to do this. So this is one of the challenges that innovation uh, often faces in the uh, current world. Now, I don't like to show Danny this particular patient, but every one, uh, this particular slide, but every once in a while, a fantastic idea just doesn't work out that well. And one of those uh, was the Surgiscope, which elect, uh, um, joined in a uh, con company in France. And I thought this was a fantastic idea, mounting the uh, microscope uh, to a surgically guided instrument. But the reality of in the operating room, it was literally like driving a Sherman tank um, in the operating room. In this particular picture, I'm doing something, the microscope, the, the nurse is left in despair. And the chief resident had to turn over to pass instruments because everybody else had given up. And then there are a few other things. That, um, uh, you know, one of the early generations, and now there's a lot of interest in intraoperative MRI scan, but the early generation devices really were not optimized in terms of thinking that it, there has to be a surgeon or surgeons who has to fit in there to be able to do this particular case. So in certain cases, I was serial number five with the uh, gamma knife, um, and it worked out very well. But there are some technologies where that's not the case. And there are many centers that are still trying to make a decision. Um, their serial number 350 or whatever it is now of, the, of Gamma Knife. So you neither want to be too early or too late. Um, and I'm still not, I, I'm on the data safety monitoring board, so I'm sort of conflicted in my interests uh, about the usage of focused ultrasound, but I think it certainly was going to prove to have value. 
Now, one of the things you have to do is, uh, and, uh, the other comment of Danny made about weight, the other was age, um, is that uh, um, eventually when you finish training in our field, you're probably at the highest of your technical skills, but you don't know when to use them or what the results are gonna be. So over the course of time, you can't see the abscissa here, but this is about 45 or 50 or so. So at this point, the combination of your surgical skills and your judgment, which is always based on prior experience, are at their highest. And then all of a sudden, now all of a sudden you get into this uh, age of about 65 or 70 and you uh, end up buying a red convertible like Thomas uh, has. Uh, um, <laughs> and, uh, and then uh, shortly thereafter, the world falls apart and both your judgment and your technical skills fall <laughs> apart. And eventually you'll need to go to Karolinska and get a cell implant for uh, your, uh, your Alzheimer's uh, dementia. Um, so how do we continue to be innovative? Uh, if you look over the course of this report uh, in the Journal of Neurosurgery, 11,000 patents over 50 years or so, the largest number related to uh, neuromodulation, clinical neurophysiology, endoscopes, operating microscopes. Um, there's been an enormous amount of technology uh, development. We as a group are very technically desirous uh, about uh, uh, doing uh, these things. But there are these threats. And those threats exist for every company as well as every person who comes up with them, uh, who owns it, uh, who developed it, uh, who's going to claim it. Uh, um, there's an enormous amount of bureaucracy, enormous amount of inertia in terms of technology uh, development. We have to deal with uh, compliance issues, IRB issues, uh, funding for these things, the development grants and industry, and their risks. Uh, the risks uh, can be academic, political, and personal. And while all of our bosses are saying, I want you to think like an entrepreneur, um, don't, uh, uh, you know, only if it has value to us, uh, but uh, not to you. Um, and then uh, this concept of how long does it take to gain, uh, to gain traction. So um, there's a difference between innovation and research. Research is uh, basically hypothesis-driven, a study designed in a formal protocol. Uh, innovative practice may be how you are going to apply an existing uh, uh, technology. And actually, we had to write an article about this because one of the committees that I have, uh, that I had at our health system, which is a now $14 billion uh, uh, health system, is evaluating technology uh, development and how it's, it's going to be uh, used. And these are the guidelines for things that we review. New or innovative costs more than $50,000 a year. It's not clinical research. The technologies are approved. C-Mark in Europe, FDA in the US, United States. And what we do is we look at uh, initially physician-based. Is Does this have some merit? Some Will it help? Is it a possibility that it will help? And then the hospital side, which is looking at, okay, how much is it going to cost? Uh, how much is it going to cost compared to how much we're going to get paid for its use? And this represents obviously big problems for hospitals uh, as well as innovators. Uh, so if we look at two examples, this is the magic scoliosis grow rods, fantastic, right? A child with a crooked spine that they can put these in and then in the, in the clinic outpatient area using a remote control thing, gradually expand these medical rods to straighten the spine out in, in, a, in a growing child. So fantastic. And when we looked at this, this is fixed in terms of how much the hospital get costs. The net loss per case is twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars. So, how does the hospital uh, survive uh, in this? Another example in the neurosurgery realm, um, perhaps being done in uh, Sweden, is a suppression of seizures by placement of an electrode in the brain. Uh, the actual receiver is placed in the skull, and then it recognizes the seizure and then stimulates the brain to stop the seizure from occurring. So the net loss per case on this, the device itself costs $37,000. So every time a patient has this particular device, the hospital loses eighteen dollars or $20,000. So that's going to make it extremely difficult uh, to uh, sustain this particular technology. This particular patient here, that I showed you earlier, is the patient with an electrode uh, quadriplegic, no arms, no leg -like function, with electrode planted in the brain, this particular patient was done on the basis of a $130 million DARPA grant from the US government, okay? Can we really spend that much money in technological development to treat it um, as an example of a single patient? Uh, knowing the desperation of this patient, but what about our other patients and other indications? 
One of the things that's certainly changed over the course of time and how we all operate is that uh, we all work as part of a group um, right now uh, and have to function as a unit. That's how Pittsburgh won two Stanley Cup uh, rings in, in a row, um, by working uh, as a cooperative uh, group. Uh, and so as we support change, we have to still go back and innovation. We have to think about these that maybe, as we said earlier, can we make things better? You have to be willing to challenge uh, the existing voices that are out there. You have to have a long-term commitment to proving its value. Flexibility in thinking, uh, sometimes the uh, challenges of your colleagues, so being perse having perseverance is, imper careful, uh, is important. Uh, working carefully with industry, but uh, in partnership with industry is very, very important as well. And then to uh, publish, as uh, we said, uh, and Danny said earlier, in peer-reviewed literature. So uh, this is actually uh, Sam Elmefti, who was, uh, took our course for some unknown reason. He was actually a prior Levacrona uh, winner, but he's been a big opponent of Gamma Knife over the course of time. And when he took the course, I think his real goal is he wanted to do my lobotomy. Um, so uh, innovation is, in fact, extremely important. Um, and there are a number of great quotes about this. But from my Swedish uh, uh, experience uh, here, um, I think it's a very important uh, to understand uh, the, uh, uh, um, the challenges that all of us have in terms of what's the carrot and what's the stick uh, that uh, makes us uh, uh, do things. Um, so uh, actually, this is a more of an update of what we ha our group has done, and I want to re-emphasize uh, our group. Uh, while I think that nothing that we have published has been done without um, very intense review, and what we've done because we have now 15,000 patients as of this week um, uh, that have been done in Pittsburgh uh, with Gamma Knife. We set up a database to be able to follow and track these particular patients, and this gave us opportunity for residents uh, students uh, in training to go back and look at individual uh, um, uh, outcomes, uh, which if we didn't have, if we hadn't had that uh, database, we would have never been able uh, uh, to do that. So in this 25-year cycle, uh, from the birth of an idea, say of Lars Lexell's, its initial evaluation in Stockholm, leading to earlier uh, publications, uh, then the usual no, it doesn't work type of thing uh, coming out, and eventually it, it does gain traction uh, in our uh, in our world of neurosurgery. So I tell uh, people that are in training in our field, uh, um, as you're beginning to think, as I did in 1978, 79. Uh, what needs to change, uh, what is changing uh, to try to predict the uh, future. And at that particular time, uh, radiosurgery and functional stir uh, surgery were uh, just beginning to reawaken in the field of neurosurgery. Um, so you need to think about, as a career choice, of what to concentrate on. Um, you know, what's building out in the water uh, that has a wave of interest, or even earlier, the first swell in the ocean. Uh, rather than thinking about all of those things that have become fully accepted in the field for which there's very little to be gained uh, from a, an academic career standpoint. Um, so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, this icon uh, for things that this is a sustaining innovation, but I think that this is something that uh, I'm hopeful that ELECTA is going to continue to work on because there are a number of projects that would allow this to continue to uh, uh, get better because uh, companies uh, need to uh, listen to uh, all of us and we need to listen to companies to work better uh, as we identify the uh, sustaining innovations that are gonna keep the disruptive innovations in, in, in track. So my colleague, uh, Ajay Naranyan, who's helped me with uh, 20 years of work uh, um, and uh, um, with this presentation, I would like to give a special uh, thanks to uh, in the hopes that uh, our future generations will also stay involved in both clinical innovation and in, in research. There's always a better way to do it, um, and I think that uh, fortunately uh, I came across one technology and, uh, which uh, obviously allowed me to help make a career, uh, but also one that I think has been very important for the uh, uh, company that has uh, made this technology. And we've been uh, pleased to be part of the team that's uh, helped uh, in uh, device uh, development over the course of time so that Gamma Knife could very much become a sustaining technology rather than just a disruptive technology. 
So thank you very much for uh, um, including me in the, uh, um, in the lecture uh, group. I'm always delighted to be back in Stockholm. It looks just like Pittsburgh, so I always feel just at home. <laughs> thank you.